ever felt really afraid, anxious? Ever told my friend, man, I feel totally overwhelmed. I'm just like mega overwhelmed. I, I, I can't meet you at this student union. I'm just like, I'm paralyzed. I'm in my, my bedroom. I, I can't move. I'm, I'm stuck here. Your anxiety has gripped you. You're worried. And, and no matter how much people say, hey, it's going to be okay. God's got you. You're like, it doesn't feel like it. It doesn't feel like he can handle this. And you just, nothing seems to calm you down. Just your heart's racing. You're uptight. You're stressed out. Well, the Bible has some answers for that because you're not the first person in the history of man to ever experience that. I know that seems strange. Like, no, no one understands the anxiety I go through. A lot of people have, surprisingly enough. And in fact, it's in the early chapters of the Bible. You ever felt like you didn't feel that close to God, even though you've been a Christian a long time? That you don't sense his presence? You, didn't, you don't feel like, where is he? I don't, I don't, I don't feel him right now. Or you don't know how he's going to bail you out of the situation. If you've ever felt that way, this chapter, Genesis chapter 15, which is part of the series we're going through in the book of Genesis, offers a solution to our fears and worries. Because Abram, the man we've studied the past couple uh, chapters on, is worried about three things. He's worried about his personal safety. He's worried about his children or his lack of children. And he's really anxious about the land, his property, because currently he's still camping. He's still living in a tent. Now, if you were living in a tent year after year, do you think that'd be on your mind at some point? You go, you know, at some point, I'd like to have a house and something more permanent. I mean, tents are awesome. We got a big tent, it's really cool. Spacious, actually, it's two rooms, got a little divider and everything. But at some point, you're going to want your own place, your own land. And that's exactly what he's facing. Abram, in Genesis 15, is experiencing what's known as the dark night of the soul. And this was written, written about 500 years ago by a, a monk. And just talking about how from time to time, we go through experiences where we feel like we're going through such a tough time, we're doing our best spiritually, yet we feel so much anxiety, so much worry, and on top of it, we don't feel close to God. And we're going, hey, God, I'm down here. I'm praying. You got to give me a little backup. And those feelings of like, I'm all by myself. And I'm not getting the support that I really need. And so when Abram experiences that, God comes in in chapter 15 with three ideas. He says, I am. Then he says, I will. Then he says, I give. I am, I will, I give. These are the three things he tells Abram in chapter 15 to relieve him, to encourage him, to build him up and let him know he's not alone. That God is still with him. Now remember from the, our last chapter, what's happened? Abram's gone into action. He's gone into military action. He's taken a, a group of 318 men. He's attacked a, a, four different kings. Kind of Lamer and his whole band of kings. He's won this huge victory. But he comes back and he's, he's freaked out. He's like, that was intense. And so we pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 15. After this... The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. Abram has just won a huge victory. I mean, a massive victory with 318 guys. I mean, it's like absolutely unheard of that he's taken on four kings and beat these guys and run them hundreds of miles north. He's also given all of the loot that he captured. I'm not going to say booty this week. Because okay? I got tons of titters last week from that word. Okay, we're not, we're just going to X that out of the vocabulary. Loot. Captured property. Treasure. Okay. 
And he's got all that. And remember the king of Sodom comes and he's like, hey, can I have my money back? And Abram, after talking to Melchizedek, says, hey, take it all. I don't need it. I don't, I don't want you to ever say that you made me rich. It's God who made me rich. But after he does that, he's afraid. He's afraid he's going to get attacked again. I mean, he beat those kings, but they could come back. And he's just got a group of a very small group of men to defend himself. And he's wondering, did I make the wrong decision? In, in, a, in a moment of magnanimity, of ge generosity, I just gave all of this treasure back to the king of Sodom. Was that stupid? Is that stupid, Sarah? Was that stupid? It wasn't stupid, was it? It was it was it was smart, right? It was smart. Okay, it was good. It was a good decision. Right? Okay, good. Have you ever been more afraid after a super intense situation than before? The other day I was on Country Club Road, and there was this you know long line here on the, on the suicide lane. And then you know how there sometimes there's a gap that opens up there? And I can see this car over here on the right wanting to cut across and go this way, head north. But they didn't see that there were cars still traveling north on Country Club. They just saw a long line of cars that were stopped. This guy pulls out, and I mean, within inches in front of me. Almost just T-bones this car coming up. And even though I wasn't there, my heart started just, whoa, that was intense, after the fact. You ever been in like a near car accident? Yeah. Or a car accident? <laughs> And during the moment, you're just cool as a cucumber, you're like, I got this. Like, there's no problem. Then afterwards, you know, your heart's pumping, the adrenaline's, I gotta calm down here. That's exactly what's happening here with Abram. After the fact, he's really worried. He's like, those guys can come back, maybe they made the wrong decision. And that's what's going on here. He's come off the mountain, and now he's down in the valley. He's like Elijah after defeating the, the 450 prophets of Baal. He beat them. It was a total victory. He looks like a total champ, but then he starts running. And so this is the first time in the Bible that the word of the Lord is mentioned. This is the first time that it says the word of the Lord came to anybody. The faith that conquers fear is in God's word, not in your feelings. That's important to understand. When you're dealing with anxiety, with panic attacks, with worry, and you're freaking, and no one else knows about it, what do you need? You need the Word of God. That's, that's what you need to reach out for. Is I need voice from God. He says, for also for the first time, do not be afraid. Or in some versions, fear not. This is the first time it says, don't be afraid. Now, it's important to, to catch this. Whenever the Bible says, do not be afraid, whenever Jesus says, do, do not be afraid, that means everyone in that setting is absolutely panicked. <laughs> they're losing it. So when God said, hey, do not be afraid, they're not just sitting there going, I got this. No, no, thanks God for the encouragement. They're like, oh my gosh, how can I not be afraid? I'm terrified. And then he talks about, listen, I want to describe who I am to you. Who I am to you. He says, I am your shield, your very great reward. He says, I am. He, this is what politicians offer. And aren't you guys excited about the 2024 elections? Yes. I mean, I just can't wait. Woo! Just the tension, the talk. I mean, I'm pumped. Okay. But this is what every politician offers, Republican or Democrat is security through the military. You're going to hear that a lot. Law and order, police. You know, we need the police. We need, we need to build the military or whatever. So security, physical safety, and secondly, economic benefits. You know, we're going to, we're going to cancel all your student loan debt. We're going to reduce all your taxes. We're going to, you vote for me, you're getting money in your pocket. So those are the two things. But it's interesting because unlike politicians, God always keeps his promises. God always keeps his promises. He's talking about the same thing here. He's saying, I'm your shield. I'm your source of personal safety. And secondly, I'm your source of benefit. I'm your reward. I am your reward. 
And so he gives them these two I am's. I am your shield. God's I am is there for you when you're feeling like I am not. You ever had that feeling like, I am not up to this. I am not the man. I am not the woman. I am not the person for this job. I am not the person who can handle this. God says, I am. I am. I am there for you. Our life is only as big as our faith, and our faith is only as big as the God we're trusting in. And so this is why it's so important for you to, to get in touch with the great I am, a sh who's a shield against the demands of the law. He's a shield against the accusations of our conscience. You ever felt really guilty? You ever had those feelings where you're like, oh man, I don't feel so good about how I'm doing or what I'm doing. God is a shield. He is your shield. He's a shield against the force of temptation. You ever have those days when you're really struggling with temptation? I had one last week. Like, man, I am being tempted big time here. I can just feel it. I can just feel it when I'm just struggling here. My, my sinful nature wants to do this. And I'm like, God, I really need some help here. And I, I just got down on my knees and said, I, I really need you to help me, God. Because even though my spiritual side doesn't want to do anything, my physical nature definitely wants to. Come on, bro. I just got to be real. And you know, it's amazing. I woke up, woke up the next morning, I like, felt totally different. Just like, it wasn't even an issue. It wasn't even crossing my mind at that point. God is your shield against temptation. He's your shield against the world's opposition. When you feel all alone as the only Christian in the city of Tucson, like, I'm the only Christian on campus. No, you're not, first of all. But he's your shield. And he's your shield against the fear of death. God is your shield. He's your protector. Whatever you're afraid of, whatever you're feeling like you're on your back foot and you're on the defense against, God's your shield to strengthen you. Isn't that encouraging? Yeah. The great I am. He says, I am your great reward. It's easy to lose track of what matters most, isn't it? Yeah. We're so busy in our lives getting new jobs, you know, getting just stepping into new situations, like, that's awesome. Just being busy with family issues. But God is saying, no matter, Abram, how much loot you give away, what you have in me that's remaining is infinitely more than anything you've given away. Yeah. I am your reward. Don't worry about that stuff. That's chump change. That's just nothing. That's pocket change, what you gave away. We tend to focus on God's gift rather than the giver. And here's something I, I want us to really drill down on. Is many, many times, I'm sorry about this, this earpiece, it keeps popping off my ear and this one, I know it's distracting, but anyway, we'll try to get it fixed next week. We tend to focus on the things God gives us. And when he's not giving us what we want, we get really uptight and we get upset because we become so dependent on those things. We get dependent on feeling good. And when we feel bad for a day, it's really tough to handle. Mm -hmm. we, we, get, we get dependent on our money. We get dependent on people liking us. We get dependent on the approval of our family or the people around us. And when that changes, all of a sudden we start freaking out. And God says, listen, beyond all that, even if you lost everything, since you have me, I am your reward. You've got more than you need. Paul said, it, it, I consider everything rubbish compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus. He's your reward. Are you happy just having a relationship with God? That's something to focus on as you move forward because Abram had lost sight of that. He's like, Man, I've lost out everything, made the wrong decisions, and I'm about to be attacked. So God says, you have nothing to worry about. No, nothing has been lost. And he offers a, God offers us a reward for sufferings that are patiently endured. Some of us, we've, we've been suffering, we've been going through some challenges, but you know God's going to reward you for that. He offers a reward for sacrifices that you made anonymously. 
Many of you have been giving anonymously to serve people, to give, to help people financially, to give them support, to, to be a fix-it helper person. And you did it without any credit at, or asking for credit. And you go, I wonder if God recognizes that. You know what? He does. He is your reward. There's a reward in heaven for you. And for the service that you've accomplished, you're getting a reward for that. you got to keep that in mind, just like Abraham needed to keep it in mind. Let's go on to the second promise God makes in response to Abram's situation. God says, I will. I will. He starts off by saying, I am, but then he goes into, I will. But Abram said, Look, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus? And Abram said, You've given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up to the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and they credited to him as righteousness. Just a little throw in here. This is probably one of the most important chapters of the Bible. I should have said this at the beginning. And in fact, verse 6 is probably one of the most important scriptures in the entire Bible. We'll talk about why later. But this is super important. So the setting here is he's in the tent, and he has a vision. The word of the Lord comes to comes to him, starts talking to him. He says, listen, I'm your shield and reward. But if you ever, you know, heard a good sermon or, or had a good quiet time, and it, it encourages you, but at the same time, you go, yeah, that's good, but, it's like, I, I know that, I know that already, but there's still this other problem. That's exactly what Abram does. He goes, okay, God says, I'm your, your shield and reward, and Abram goes, that's good, but really, I've got this other issue. You haven't given me any kids. And so you can just sense the frustration because he's getting older. He's probably 85 at this time. And he's like, just, I mean, no rush or anything, but my wife's 75 and she's still a hottie. But anyway, she's getting up there. Just want to put that out there, God. And this is the first time that there's a dialogue between Abram and God. Up until this time, God has said, hey, you, you need to leave your family and your home and go into the to land I'm going to show you. But all of a sudden, Abram, 10 years into it, starts speaking up. And he's like, wait a second. God, you're awesome, but I'm concerned about this area. And Abram has heard his promise before, before this, in chapter 12. But God seems to be doing nothing. And that's why it's so frustrating with Abram. It's like, God's got all these awesome promises, but they don't seem to be coming true in his personal life. You ever had that feeling? Yeah. Like, I know the Bible says that, but hey, here I am. How about me? And then God states what will and what will not be. He says, listen, God, I don't have any kids. I'm childless. So I'm going to have to, I guess, take everything you've given me and I'll just give it to this servant. And he's going to inherit it. Inherit, he's going to inherit the land, I guess. Because I don't make kids. One thing we need to know is that God's will, he states what will and what will not be. That's what he says. He says, no, that's, that's not what's going to happen. That, that man will not be your heir. You're going to have a child. He will be your heir. And God's will must be fulfilled in God's way and God's time. This is where we really struggle because we are very short. Our lives are very short. A long time for us is like seven days. It's like, okay, pray on Monday. Nothing's happened by Wednesday afternoon. And we're like, okay, okay, I'll, I'll give it to Thursday at three. God still hasn't acted. And God here is talking, he's taking years. Later in the chapter, he's talking like 400 years. 
So we've got a gap between our time horizon and what God is saying. God's will must be fulfilled in his way and in his time. And Abram didn't realize that God was waiting until Abram and Sarai were as good as dead. We read in Romans chapter 419 that only when they were as good as dead did God fulfill the promise. So Abram's like, hey, is it going to happen this year, do you think? And God doesn't say it, but he says, no, it can't happen this year because you're not as good as dead yet. We got to give that to you about 100. I'll call that as good as dead. And so what we wrestle with is God's promises are true, but we don't have control over the time frame in which they're going to be fulfilled. That's where we really struggle. I, I certainly struggle. It's like, God, I want this to be done sometime in 2023. <laughs> but it may not be. Right. God has plans that are way beyond. And the problem is we don't know what his plans are. And so he can be talking years down the road, but we're still called to be faithful no matter what. God called him outside of his tent. How do we know that? Because at this point, he says, you know, takes him outside, and then he says, look up at the sky. When your outlook is bad, when you're looking down, like we talked about last, last week, it's really important to have an uplook. And God does that again in this situation. He gets him out of his little claustrophobic tent, takes him outside. Okay, there's no light pollution. Okay, there's no street lamps there in the Middle East. And it must have just been amazing because he looks his, look up at the sky and it's just loaded with stars. And he says, go ahead, give it a try. Count how many stars there are. Go ahead, think you can do it? He says, that's how many kids you're going to have. Count them. What's amazing about Abraham, even though he was so low at that time, when God said, this is how many kids you're going to have, Abram believed him. He believed him, and God credited, credited to him as righteousness. So when, when God gave his promise again, he believed wholeheartedly. Chapter 15, verse 6, is the Bible's first reference directly to Abram's faith. And it says, Abram believed God. In the Hebrew, there's only five words, but it's such a powerful statement that he makes about, about Abram. Abram believed God. It means literally Abram said, Amen, God, so be it. And another translation is that Abram became steadfast or firm in God. When we're anxious and when we're worried, we, we don't feel really settled, do we? We don't feel anchored in our relationship with God. But at this point, when God said, this is how many children you're going to have, Abram just set his feet and he said, okay, I believe that. There's a lot of feelings, a lot of things going on, but I believe and I trust your word in spite of how I feel. And when God looked at that, it pleased him. And God reckoned it to him as righteousness. Believing in this context means to lean your whole weight on something. It means just saying, okay, I am all in. You ever, anyone have a little fly, uh, fear of flying? I know Matt Wharton doesn't, but um, <laughs> anyone in here get on a commercial airline, you're just nervous, you had to take a couple better drill. Okay, got one here, one in the back, one there. Okay, the rest of you guys are cool cucumbers, no problem. <laughs> my wife always holds my hand, you know, we take off the way. I just say, I'm not gonna just hold my hand. Like, okay. <laughs> She's awesome. But, I mean, there's times when we used to live in Asia, there would, we'd go from country to country over vast sections of the ocean. I'd get a little nervous. Like, I, I don't want to be lost at sea here. And it's, it's a little spooky at times. And you get that huge, you know, just the bottom drops out. And, oh, my gosh. I hope it stops here soon. And there were times when I, I felt like I was like, I'm not going to put my full weight down. I can't, I gotta like help the pilot a little bit, just gotta be a little lighter in here. So I'm not gonna pull my full weight down if I see it. Let's see if I can float a little bit. 
That's what we do when we don't go all in on our faith. We're not fully invested spiritually in our relationship with God. We're trying to come up with like a back exit just in case. We've got to help him along. God needs a little assistance from us because otherwise his promises won't come true. And that's the faith that Abraham had. He just went all in. Have you ever seen the video Full Send where the guy takes that, the uh, snowmobile? <laughs> he says, what does he say? You got to be kidding. <laughs> Don't be silly. I'm going to go Full Send. Okay, <laughs> look it up on YouTube. One of the highest quality, most amazing videos of all time. <laughs> and he just takes a snowmobile and jumps, crashes it. I mean, it's crazy. But he just goes all in. Or he doubles down. He just says, I know it's crazy, but I still believe. Abram may not have known it at this moment, but God imputed or credited righteousness to him in response to his faith. Now that word imputed, or what does it say? God credited to him as righteousness. Means to put to one's account, or put into one's account. Like, let's imagine that you get a tax return this year. You get a tax return? Yeah. How does that feel when you wake up in the morning, you check your bank account, and all of a sudden, it's deposited in there? Is that a good feeling? Is that a good day? You're like, yes. That's the image here, is that God just drops into your account, not money, but a right relationship with Him. That's what righteousness, doesn't mean all of a sudden righteous in the sense of, hey, God, He does everything right. We already know Abram did quite a few things that were a little offbeat. Not quite on target. But in terms of his relationship with God, he says, you have a perfect relationship with me going forward. You're right with me. We're at peace. You're forgiven. And he just credited to him because of his faith. Now, in this, in this sense, on the cross, our sins were put on Jesus' account. What did Jesus wake up that day? It says all of Angel's sins got dumped into his account. All of Katie's sins got dumped onto Jesus' account. All of Rob's sins got put, imputed to Jesus on the cross. And at the same time, when we believe and repent and are baptized, Jesus' righteousness is imputed or credited into our account. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. You know, when Ben got baptized last summer, guess what? He got a huge deposit that day in his righteousness account. Because from that day and every day since, it reads full of righteousness. Isn't that amazing? Ben's totally right and still is to this day. That's pretty amazing, even though he may have bad days in between. So let's apply two aspects of Abram's faith to our own lives. Abram had a fully persuaded faith, and he had a faith that works. A fully persuaded faith and a faith that works. Let's, the, the new, this is such an important passage that the New Testament really digs into this chapter. And so let's read these commentaries on the Old Testament. In chapter 4 of Romans, Paul says this, Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. That's Genesis 15, 6. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words, it was credited to him, were written not for him alone, but for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. If we could have someone turn that cooling on a little bit, start to lose a few people on the right and the left. So if we could just tur t turn it down just a little bit. Okay, this is a long passage. I don't, have to, I don't have time to dig into all of it. But what it says here is that against all hope, remember, Abram is really struggling here at this moment, but the, the very absurdity, 
the very craziness of the fact that God was saying, hey, I know you don't have any kids, and I know you're an old man, but still, I want you to believe something. You're going to have so many children. That it was so absurd, so crazy on a humanistic level, that it somehow sparked a level like, this is so crazy, I believe it. And that's what he did, stimulated his faith. He just said, this is so wild, I trust that it's going to happen. That's the kind of faith that God is looking for, that all-in faith. And I love, too, because it says in verse 23, the words, it was credited to him, were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. You know what's so powerful about Genesis 15, 6? He says, that promise was for Abraham. That was for him. But it's true for everyone who has faith in Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? He says, you're going to be credited righteousness to, with righteousness in response to your faith. Now, don't, don't, don't get all proud like, yeah, I'm such a faithful person. My faith is just, just blockbuster level of faith. The very faith you have, that comes from God. That was a gift also. So don't go, you know, I'm just born with faith. God gave you that faith. And that's pretty awesome. But he responds to that in love. Now, how do we illustrate this kind of faith? And I, I really struggle with illustrations on this because I'm like, how can I try to convey what kind of fully persuaded faith that he has? It says he was fully persuaded. No doubts. And when I struggle for illustrations, I go back to my, my, my bread and butter. I go back to my, something I just count on. You know what that is? The Matrix. Okay, let's go ahead, the next slide here. Before we run this. 1999, I know some of you were negative three when this came out. But here's Trinity and Neo, and what's happening here is Neo is the, he's the Messiah, okay? He's Neo, he means new. And what happens is they place their hope that somehow he's going to change this bad situation where the machines run the world. And they place all their hope in him that he's going to make everything better. He's the one. Yep. But what happens is he gets shot and killed by Agent Smith, right? Agent Smith, that's right. And so I'm not going to show that scene where he, he gets shot, but he gets shot a bunch of times, and he dies, and he flatlines. Now, what's happening is here is his body is back on the ship. Now, you got to watch this shit. Okay, you think, like, you know, War Room is powerful or any sort of... Uh, there's a lot of good, you know, religious movies and stuff like that, but this is, I think, the best. <laughs> and it's not even a Christian movie. But... See that, 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 that line that's going behind her? Okay, the, the droids or the sentries, they're like tearing apart this ship. And she's doing nothing because she knows that she can't save herself. She knows that there's nothing she can do. The only hope she has is this guy coming back to life. Which reminds us of Jesus. <laughs> Right? So when you're all in your in, with your faith, you go, listen, I don't even have to worry about all of this craziness and overwhelm stuff and people attacking me and stuff. I don't have to deal with that stuff because I can't solve that problem. The only person who can is Jesus. And so she's as calm as a cool as a cucumber about all this stuff that's happening because she knows that it all depends on this guy coming back to life. Right. So let's just watch this scene. Just got shot. There you go. Flat lines. Uh oh, we need the sound, man. Can we restart it? He says it can't be. That's what he says.
Let's give a hand to our AV. This is a camp B. There we go. to uh, a Taylor Swift concert on Friday night. <laughs> and it was such an incredible concert. Best concert I've ever seen. I mean, my, my daughter bought me tickets, so I, I went, and it was incredible. And I was telling her afterwards, I said, I mean, the show production was amazing. 70,000 people there, three hours long. Just fire and smoke and all sorts of stuff, and just light shows, and the sound was incredible. Just amazing. And I told her, I said, this performance and production is second only to an average Sunday TCOC. <laughs> I mean, it rivals it, but it's not quite there yet. And I was like, yes. Okay, back, back to our group. Okay. <laughs> now that was powerful. <laughs> okay. I love that I love that section because she's just like, hey, I love you. I know that you're gonna come back to life. Because it's just gotta be. And she's all in on this relationship. And guess what? It comes back to life and it's it's awesome. But my question for you is, are you all in in your relationship with God? Yeah. I mean, all in. Yeah. Full send. No back door. Some of us, we're just kind of, we're here and then we're out. We come to church for a while, then we're out. We, we, we get faithful for a while, but then we back off. And we're so unsteady in our faith in Jesus Christ. We're looking for other things to make us happy. We're looking for other solutions to solve the problems around us rather than saying, listen, God, it's crazy, but I believe what you're telling me. I am doubling down in my relationship with you. And I want to challenge some of us because we're so flaky in our faith level. We're so unstable. We're like, yeah, I 90% there. And God is saying, listen, just believe me. Just trust me. The second thing about Abram's faith is a faith that works. In James chapter 2, 
He says, you foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled, it says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, and not by faith alone. That can seem like a contradiction when it says, you know, you just need to have faith. But he says, faith that's true faith is a faith that works. Abraham had a faith that resulted in action. It was defined by action. And you can see his faith by what he did. Because first, he moved to the promised land. He didn't just go, wow, that's interesting. I'm going to stay right here. <laughs> he moved. He, he got circumcised. We're going to read about that in chapter 17. He offered up his son Isaac when God said, Hey, you know that one child you've been waiting 25 years for? I'm going to need you to kill him. And next morning, he took action. He said, Okay, if that's what you say, he's going to, he's going to do it. Salvation is not either faith or works, but it's faith expressing itself through love. Or through works. It's faith that works. In Galatians 5, 6, Paul says, The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. How are you expressing your faith? A true faith is one where people, you can see it because it changes your behavior. It changes how you spend your time, how you spend your money, what you watch on TV, who you spend your time with. What, what you think is important, what you think is not important. All of those things are expressions. How you serve people, how you treat your wife is an expression of your faith. All of those things combined reveal whether you have a faith that works. You're not saved through the product of what you do, but that faith that prompts love is a true faith that works. Right. We're going to finish it out in the last section when God says, I give. In Genesis 15, 7 through 21, he also said to him, I am the Lord, who brought you out of Ur of the child called the ends to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I'll gain possession of it? Okay, so he's struggling here because he's like, there's like 10 tribes of people around me. This is, this is a big challenge. So the Lord said to him, bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut, cut them in two, and arranged the house opposite each other. The birds, however, he didn't cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. Next slide. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they'll come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land, from the wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Rephaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. This third statement says, I give. This is known as cutting a covenant. And so what, what God is saying, God knows that at this point, Abram needs a little reassurance. You ever need like a little backup to your faith? Like, okay, I believe it, but I could use a little bit of extra support here. And that's what he gives. Think about this for Abram. He doesn't have a church. He doesn't go to church on Sundays down at, you know, Speedway Boulevard. He's just by himself. It's just him and his wife. That would be challenging to keep your faith. Of course, you're having visions, but you don't have a, you don't have a written Bible. You don't have the kind of regular support that we do. And so God said, like, I'm going to have to really give this guy some additional support. 
So if the person making this covenant, what this means here, doesn't fulfill the obligations, it's like, may he be like the animals that are sacrificed. So that's, that's what this is saying here. Saying, listen, God's saying, may I be like these animals if I don't fulfill this promise to you. That's a pretty serious covenant. And God wanted to condescend to Abraham's faith level. And later, in, in chapter 22 and in chapter 26, he promises by himself. He swears by himself. Yep. You know, when God when you say, I swear to God, it's tough for God to say, I swear, I, swear to, I swear to myself. I swear by myself. And God clarifies the promise. He says, your descendants will possess the land, but only after 400 years in another country will they inherit the land. And only after the Amorites have been given 400 years to repent will they be able to come back into this land. So sometimes people get really critical about God saying, oh, he's so bloody, he's so judgmental. God gave them 400 years to change their behavior. And so the Israelites were simply a tool of his judgment. It wasn't that the Israelites were any better, but God said, listen, after 400 years, they're going to be judged for their sin. Then there's a smoking fire cloud. This is like the smoke and fire we see on Mount Sinai. Those are symbols of God's presence. And like the cloud and fire that we read in the book of Exodus. And only God passes through those animals. He falls asleep. It's a terrifying sleep. It's like a night terror. And he just sees a smoking fire cloud pass through. So this covenant, what does that mean? It's one-sided. God is going to fulfill this promise. Abraham doesn't have to do anything. It's a one-sided covenant or reassurance. So that wraps up this chapter. Let's just recap. How does God help you and me when we're struggling with anxiety? Mental health, panic attack, worry, anxiety. I hear those words almost daily. And as a minister, so often. <coughs> struggling, overwhelmed, fear, all these issues. He offered Abram, and he offers you promises through his word. He says, I am, I will, and I give. Let's, let me leave you with some next steps. First of all, memorize Genesis 15, 6, one of the most important scriptures in the Bible. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited to him as righteousness. Why don't we just read that together out loud? This will be your first start. Okay, start with, Abram believed the Lord, and he credited to him as righteousness. Okay, that's a great scripture to memorize. Secondly, go all in on your faith. Stop half-stepping it. Some of us were just thinking about it, maybe want to, could be next week. We we're almost there. When are you going to go all in? Some of you need to make a decision. I want to repent and get baptized this week. I'm ready to do it. I'm ready to go all in. What's holding you back? Be like Abraham. Just full send it. Just go for it. Stop waiting and go all in on your faith. And start expressing that faith through love. Have a faith that works. By getting involved in relationships, serving people, loving other people. You can pass out trays on Sunday. You can do so many different things, but let that faith work. Yeah. And finally, we're getting ready for our big Easter service. And I, I'd like to ask you, I want to ask everyone to be praying that we fill this up. We've got something really exciting. This year, we're not going to have just one service. We're going to have two. We're going to have a, a regular service at one, and then we're going to have a Spanish service that Angel Arment is preaching on. Oh at 3 p.m. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. And so, if you're a Spanish speaker, you can come at one, but at three, there's gonna be a Spanish service. And so, we're gonna have an egg hunt in between. So, one o'clock, okay. If you're over 50, you're, you're out of the egg hunt, just, just so you know. I don't wanna build up your bones. One o'clock is the service, then at 2.30 when we're done, we're gonna have an egg hunt, we're gonna have food there, from 2.30 to 3, egg hunt, and then the Spanish service starts at 3. It'll go till 4, and then finish at 4.30. So I'd like to ask you to take a prayer walk through your neighborhood this week. Just go with your husband and just start praying, saying, God, help me to get a neighbor to, to Easter service this year. And so let's go ahead and close in a prayer.
for the, for the sermon. Then we're going to come up and sing a song. Heavenly Father, give us faith, the faith that Abram had. He is the father of our faith, and Lord, we want to have that same level of faith. There are so many times we confess that we struggle with sin, that we struggle with anxiety and worry because we're not in control, Lord, and we want to be. Only you're in control. And I want to pray that we have a faith that's all in, that we, we don't try to back out, we don't try to hedge our bets, but we are placing all our trust in Jesus Christ, who's our Savior, and who rose from the dead on our behalf. And I pray that our faith is a faith that's real and genuine, that's visible and expressed through our, our work, our love, and our daily behavior. Please raise our faith. God, we do believe in you. Increase our faith. Help us overcome our unbelief. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.